It's a great honor and a privilege to introduce Bruce Devore and Boaz Barak Abrams. We're in your wonderful apartment here in Jerusalem. And Thank you have got an incredible journey, an incredible story. So if you could just let us know what attracted you to Judaism and your life journey. Hmm. Okay. Well, we've both been looking for Hashem. Me after my father died, going on 30 years ago. And my wife has always been looking for Hashem. After my father died, I started the search. I it was America, so Christianity was the obvious choice. Started attending churches, and after moving back down into Denver from the mountains, the old Littleton Clinic I used to go to as a child was now a community center and the Littleton Vineyard was meeting there and I knew right away when I saw the sign out front I'm supposed to go there. Started attending that church and became very good friends with a lot of the people there and went there for years. Started praying for my wife, a wife, and after quite some time I was told well if you're going to, if you want to get married you have to start dating. And I said, no, I'm not praying for a date, I'm praying for a wife. And it was two weeks after I said that, I believe, I met my friend's home group, and my future bride walks in there, she's from out of town, she also was a vineyardite, or was, and somehow, some way, she got a hold of that place, those people, and was at my home group, and well that was all Hashem she left a little bit early and it was a soul to soul connection because when she left I announced to all my friends I was going to marry that woman it's the first time you ever saw her first time yes boss can I ask did you grow up um, in a religious Christian family were your parents my parents Christians? were Christian but when my sister died of a brain tumor when she was 10 years old they stopped going to church uh, my dad did completely. My mom and uh, my brother and I, we went for a little while after that, but it wasn't long and we stopped going to church. And where, where did you, where were you born? I, I was born in Iowa, but I had such horrible ha asthma and hay fever that the doctor said, go move to a dry climate. So we moved to Denver, Colorado when I was about two, two or three, somewhere in there. I consider myself a, a Colorado native because I was raised there. And what year were you born? 1952, August 1952. And it wasn't long before we were there as I mentioned and went to school there. Um, and your parents, they uprooted because of your asthma and they moved to... Yes, they moved to Colorado for me. So it was... Uh, Denver back then was a tiny town for, for a capital for a state. It was like 300,000 people total in the entire metro area. Beautiful. Mom and Dad had a house built in South Denver and while it was being built we lived in a small hotel. I remember that place. It was a dump. <laughs> but when the house was built we moved into a brand new house that nobody had ever lived in and it wasn't well it was a couple of years after that that my sister as I mentioned developed a brain tumor and passed within a very short time and obviously that changed everything they were my parents were wonderful when uh, when she passed they um, how would I put it they shut down emotionally, subconsciously. They had no idea they were doing this, but it was the perfect storm. My brother and I went through the 60s and the 70s without normal parent supervision. They had no idea what we were doing. And so my brother and I went through a rough time. But in the end, all these years later, I'm the last one alive. My entire family has passed. I got to see them all three years ago at Yom Kippur. 
was it three years ago? Three years ago at Yom Kippur, during the East Coast service. Um, my, Hashem showed them all to me. They're, they're all there, they're all smiling, they're in a good place, so that took a load of weight off of my shoulders to know they're all in a good place. And Deborah, can I ask, where were you born and uh, what type of family did you grow up in? I was also born in Iowa in 1965 um, in a small town about a little over 800 people. It was a small farm town. Um, both of my parents were work, uh, worked blue-collar jobs um, and we struggled because they were young. And um, that's where I spent er um, all, most of my young childhood and I was um, it was kind of an odd an odd child because I didn't fit the mold of anybody else around me and I'll explain by saying I, I was the child that would used to go out and stargaze I was the even as a little child I would go out and sit and watch the clouds um, laid in the grass I was very keen in nature so I I had a very strong inkling as a young young girl toward this entity that I didn't know at the time was God, and I started to try to look out and, and, and find uh, where did we all come from? How did it all come? How did we get here? What where? Who made this? Because it, I, that was very it was very um, important to me to know because I saw a structure, I saw order, I saw all of these things as just a small child and my parents were not, um, my dad is not religious at all. My mom grew up in a Christian church but she didn't go to church after they were married so there was no, and my sister didn't, didn't really have an interest in it at all. So at the age of about seven I decided I was going to go look for this God because at this point I had, you know, I, my favorite movie as a child was The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. What I saw that ocean, <laughs> that that sea split, and I thought, I want to know that God. I want to be one of His children. You know, I want to be that. So I started to look for Him, and I, I, there in small town Iowa, there's only little Christian churches here and there. So there was a church bus that would drive through the neighborhoods to take the kids to church. So I would get into my Sunday best, and I would toddle out to the uh, to the edge of the driveway and wait for the bus. And I went to church every morning by myself on Sunday mornings, uh, in hopes to find uh, who who this God was. And did your sister join you? No, no. And um, that's why I said I was kind of odd and strange because I didn't seem to fit in my family. I didn't seem to fit in the you know my friends thought I was strange because I was always wanting to talk about God, you know, talk about where did everything come from. And um, so that, I, I didn't have a lot of friends in, in, as a child. I was uh, pretty much alone. Um, but I wasn't alone because I had this connection with, with, uh, with this God. And uh, yeah. so when I was, when I graduated high school, I got into some trouble because I left home and you know I didn't I had my parents were very strict and there was a lot of structure in the home uh, when I left home I got into some trouble and my mom her first reaction was okay I've got to help my daughter so she got a hold of a friend of mine's mother so my friend's mother and she asked her about what she was doing because she had went away to become a missionary with a group called Youth with a Mission. So we're on the world, you know, and still today there's, there's bases all around the world. And so she got the information and that was in 1983, um, probably wanting to say November of 1983. And in January of 1984, I was on a bus from Iowa to Texas to the Tyler, Texas base at YWAM where I was going to be a missionary because my mom knew that she had to do something to save me. I was not going in anywhere good. And that was her only option that she thought. So she put me on a bus and that's where I went. And I, uh, I was there for two and a half years. I went through some training and went to many countries, um, had lots of experience, made a lot of friends, you know. Um, but then I went back home. 
But Can I ask which countries did you visit? Or did I you was visit in um, Mexico, Guatemala, um, Scotland, England. Um, we spent two, two months in Scotland. Uh, spent two months in Guatemala, um, traveling all over the United States, all over Canada, from one side of the to the other um, by bus. I mean, it was like it, it really was. We lived a lot on the road. And Tell them where you got baptized. <laughs> um, there, it, the Guatemala base had been previously an Israeli embassy, <laughs> and there was a swimming pool there, and so they were going to do baptisms because I was not, I had never been baptized. And so we went to the pool, and I have the picture. I have to find it. The picture has a star of David on the bottom of the pool in tile. <laughs> and I was baptized over the star of David. So it was very interesting that, you know, all the way back then, that was, uh, that was where I, um, I started to get some sort of inkling. Because, I, you know, I never met a Jewish person. I didn't know what Jewish people were or who they were. I grew up in a small farm town. You didn't know these things. And um, so, you know, I did, I, I found out, I have to back up because when I was 16 in high school still, I watched that movie, The Holocaust, that HBO did a, a mini series on the Holocaust. And I was horrified. I'd never seen such horrific things done to other people. And I just cried for so long. I was just I, un, uncontrollable watching that. Where did you watch it? Was it part of the school curriculum? No, it was something I watched on my own. I thought, what is this Holocaust movie? So I, and, and that's where I first, that's where I got the, the idea about the Jewish people. But when I was, you know, and then a few, later, a few years later, I was in Guatemala being baptized in this Israeli, you know, swimming pool. And, and, and that only, I, so I, I have to say the only idea I had about Jewish people was from the Holocaust movie that I'd watched. That was really the only thing. And it was never taught in school? No, I don't remember anything like that being taught in school. So um, I, that w I, mm -hmm. I had my, um, my years in YWAM and went back home, but because I did not have a, re a stable religious life there, my family was not religious, I didn't have any friends that were religious. Basically, I was just going back and I was by myself. And I met a man and ended up getting married and um, had two children, two daughters. Uh, the marriage failed and it was a very hard time for me. So that brings me up to the point where, um, you know, I, miracles happened to where I knew from a day I was a little girl, I knew one day I was going to Colorado. I'd never been there. We didn't take that family vacations, but I knew by watching the westerns on television <laughs> that that's you know the mountains and all that. I wanted to go there. That's Colorado. I want to go there. So um, when I got the opportunity, I decided to go, and I drove out to Denver. Um, decided to go look at a home group, which a home group is like a. Um, it's, they get together to, and they study some scripture together and they have a meet, you know, some mm. snacks and things. So the Christians get together and they pray for each other. And they, it's, that's what a home group is. So I went to the home group and that's where I met him. And he met me. And that was our first encounter with each other. And I thought he was kind of an interesting fellow. Uh, I didn't have the same experience that he had. Um, but it was, you know... I was praying that Hashem would provide me with a man who loved God but would be a good father for my children because that's what I needed. I was a single mom. It was very hard. I was working two jobs. And you were um, looking after your daughters. And I was looking after my daughters and living in Iowa. And um, at one point I was in a, a country western band um, to try to make a little extra money, you know. So I, and, and, But that was... I was up late and away from the, the girls, so I didn't do that much, and I moved to Colorado instead because I needed them to be in a secure environment, and uh, that's where I've always wanted to go since I was a little girl. So I picked up and moved to Colorado with my, with my children, and um, when, I, when I met him at the home group, I went back. Thirty days later, I moved to Colorado because I had already secured an apartment. I was looking for a job, and... Um, when I um, when I came to pull into the uh, parking lot with my moving truck, he was sitting in the parking lot waiting for me on his motorcycle, <coughs> ready to help unload. 
I mean, he was he was like there on the spot from day one and never left. I mean, he just he would go home and he would come back the next day and have meals with us and and he took my daughters out for ice cream and he took uh, me for rides on the motorcycle. We would have amazing rides up in the mountains of Colorado on his motorcycle. Um, many weekends spent doing that. Um, it was really a magical time. Um, so I moved out to Colorado on Memorial Day and the 4th of July he right. proposed and on Labor Day in September that same year is when we got married. So you, you can never forget your anniversary. <laughs> no, because it's always on a holiday. Yeah. So like <laughs> yeah. And boys, were you ever married before or this is? I was and it was a short marriage. In fact, it was so short it was annulled. It, it, it didn't work at all and by mutual agreement we went whoops and annulled it which means it, we weren't even married six months mm -hmm. and there were no kids involved no kids yeah and the first the moment you saw uh it was a soul-to-soul -soul <laughs> connection that's all i can think of because i kn part of me right away knew this is the woman you've been praying for and i announced it to the home group that night when she left and some of the people in the in the church there came to me and said, "Now don't you chase her off." <laughs> <laughs> but I, I proposed to her on in the park playing volleyball w between games. I proposed to you on the Fourth of July, right? Yes, okay. you did. <clears throat> and how did your daughters react? Oh, they loved him. Uh, my youngest uh, was four, turning five, and our uh, the oldest was um, nine, and because he was the man that came around and took them for ice cream and you know he was very nice and he's he's it's a very gentle man gentle soul and they really liked him right off the bat so they really liked we he would take us to parks and they would play and we'd sit and talk and and it was it was a wonderful time and you both were on the same religious path mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. we were both looking and we stayed going to that church yeah. for years and through a series of events, Hashem set up things like we went to a Seder? No, that was, that was uh, in New Hampshire. Okay. So, All right. Yeah, so then we, we, we went and we got married. Um, immediately after, this, was, this is just who we are, immediately after we got married, uh, the next month there was classes being uh, taught in Colorado Springs. That's right. uh, once a month for two years, we went to a class learning about prophecy. So we would make the hour, almost hour drive, it's like 45 minutes down to Colorado Springs and t attend these classes. And then after the prophecy class was done, they started up another two year cycle on healing. So we went to that class as well. So four, four years of going back and forth just to learn about these different subjects. And it was at that point, um, then, we, then we moved into our house, we bought our first house together. Mm. And um, so that the girls could have a, um, you know, a, pleasant life with a neighborhood because we were living in a condo at the time it was on the edge of a park so we wanted them to have a home um, so we bought a home and that was a miracle in itself that, I mean <laughs> because of his VA uh, VA uh, status GI bill, his GI, GI bill, bill. Yep. we were able to purchase our home with no money down and be able to get in I mean it was it was just everything worked out smoothly yep. and um, we uh, started going to classes after the uh, classes in the Colorado Springs area had ended. Um, there was a ministry called Streams Ministries that dealt mainly with uh, Christian dream interpretation and prophecy. Mm -hmm. They came and did some sort of a um, what do you want to call that? Show. It's no. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a shear, but it, it's a okay. you know in Christian terms, it's like they came training. and they did a training. You know. And so we went to see what it was about, and it was like, oh my gosh, it was cutting edge evangelism. It was it was new. It wasn't your typical Christian stream, and for us, it was like right up our alley. It was like we were always kind of heading towards spiritual things, and so we started attending those classes, and we did that for three three years before moving up to New Hampshire. That's where the uh, corporate offices were. Uh, so we met in 1999, married in 1999, and uh, started going to the Streams classes, I think it was in 2000, 2001. So it had been four years, four yeah. or five years. And uh, we decided 
we wanted to work with this ministry. I mean, it was something that we really believed in and we were uh, involved in. Um, we were doing evangelism in our city. We had a, a dream team that we had as established. Um, we were leading and going to events uh, in Colorado in different various places. I went to the Sundance Film Festival and did, uh, and they had dream teams that went and would talk to people and video their dreams and try Sundance. to talk to them. Sundance Film Festival in Utah. So, in Utah. Yeah. So, you know, we were very in much enmeshed in this and, and attending church. We were the pillars. We were very much, um, we were in leadership um, in the church. We were looked up to. Uh, my husband is an amazing man. He would prayer walk Littleton, the city of Littleton. He had a, a, a particular path that he did. He prayer walked that street every, every Saturday for eight years without fail. I think you can count five times where he didn't make it. But he Actually, it was more like 11 years. Yeah, he, <laughs> he, he prayer walked that, and, and what a prayer walk is, is just praying for the community, praying for the people, praying. He did that for faithfully for 11 years. I think it was a snowstorm in our, in our, in our, in our wedding night that he, he didn't make it. So, um, but yeah, that's just who he is. He's, he's very dedicated. Uh, he, that's what I really, appreciated about him is that he was so dedicated and, and searching for God in such a, a strong and passionate way. And if you stood, if you were around him for any more than five minutes, you were going to hear about God because that was the first thing he would talk to you about. And when you spoke about God, did you speak about Jesus as well? Was that part Jesus of is the one I led with, yeah. I, w I would talk about Je Jesus, unfortunately. The funny thing is, as my pastor told me, he said, you have an amazing faith. You have an amazing belief. And as I discovered, I did, but it was in Hashem, not in JC. So, so just for our distance, JC's uh, Jesus Christ. Yes, that's, that's yeah. we, we don't like we to, to say, say the JC. Yeah. yeah. So, or the J-man, I mean, okay. we can call him that, but um, yeah, so that was, um, that was basically us. We were just on this path trying to learn and trying to grow. We were trying to help other people get on the path. You know, we wanted to do this new stuff we were learning. We wanted to teach and we were in the church. We were in leadership. So, but there came a point where we wanted to go and be involved with the ministry and it was in New Hampshire. And some friends of ours from the church had already went and he was working with the ministry in New Hampshire. And so we started talking about that and I had a dream. This would have been... Um, Right. September um, of 2005 and the dream was that uh, I <laughs> it's, um, somebody called me on the phone the phone rang I picked it up and it sounded like my friend Craig who was in New Hampshire working with the ministry but so I thought okay I'm answer he says never fear um, Reese is here to show you to your new home and that was the message he gave me on the phone. So I thought, okay, and I hung up. You tell him who Reese was. Reese is one of the teachers, and he worked with Streams. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, when we knew him, so when I said Reese's here, you know, I thought that's a strange, strange dream, strange message. You know, just I wrote it down. Um, in November of 2005, we went. We thought if we're going to move to New Hampshire, let's go look and take take a look and do a pilot trip and see what's out there. So we went up and visited our friends. We stayed with them. My husband was interviewing a job with the state of New Hampshire. And they told him, if you move to New Hampshire, you've got a job. What type of work was, would that entail? A highway department, maintenance, snow removal, things like that. And highway maintenance. Yeah. So we, we went to the interview and then we thought, okay, he's got a job. We're going to need a house. And the way that, excuse I'm sorry. Sure. The way that happened was not typical. I called them and they said, look, if you fly up here, we'll take time and we'll meet you. And that's not how it works. Yeah. You fill out an elaborate form online and you set up appointments. You don't just do that. But they were interested. It was all Hashem again. And so they met me informally and told me I had a job if I moved there, and which it doesn't work that way, but it did that time. So we're driving through the countryside after his interview. And Months later. No, it was on the same trip. Oh, that's right. So, and, and he, he sees in, uh, um, back 
in the woods a little bit, there was a house and it was a real estate office. And he said, well, should we, should we go and take a look? And I didn't say anything. So he just whipped a U-turn and went back and drove up and we went inside and there was a woman. And so we said, she's, you know, we, we greeted her and she said, so what can I do for you? And we said, well, we want to move to New Hampshire, but we need a house. We need to look at some properties um, to rent. And my husband said, well, we, we don't have any money. We have two girls, two dogs, and no money. Can you help us? <laughs> and she paused for a moment and she said, yes. And so she reached in <laughs> and she, into her desk and pulled out some files on some properties that were for rent in the area. And she said, I'll take you to show, I'll show these to you. So they were property descriptions. They had a picture of the, the, the house and all the in information. And, and so she took us to the first one and had a, a kind of a, a different floor plan. I didn't really care for it. Um, and in the same neighborhood, as a new neighborhood. It was in a cul-de-sac. There was another one that she took us to. And as soon as I walked in, it was like, I love this house because I need light. And this had windows, big windows all over. There was light streaming through the house. And the kitchen was beautiful, and it was a three bedroom, it was a Cape Cod, so it had, you know, a garage, and it was just brand, brand new. And um, so, or somebody previous had lived there, but it was relatively new. And um, I told her, I said, This is it, this is the one, we're going to take it. We had no money, we had no money to put a deposit down, nothing. We said, We're going to take it. And she said, Okay, so we'll sign the, we'll fill out the papers. So we go back to the office and she gives us the application, takes our information, because we're still living in Colorado at this point, but she gives us the property description. The picture. And, yeah. And so we go back to our friends and we tell them that we saw this, you know, we went and looked at this property and my friend Craig, who we were staying with, that was in the dream, I thought it was Craig calling me. He looks at the picture on the front of the property description and he says, this is Reese Saunders' old house. Wow. Reese was the one who said, never fear, Reese is here mm. to show you to your new home. We ended up living in that house. He mm. was the one that lived there previous before us. So the dream was, a, was a, one of those little things. It's like, yes, that you're on the right track, so keep coming. So we, we've always had this breadcrumb trail before us. You know, when, I, when yeah. I was a single mom and I wanted to go to Colorado, I didn't have any money. And within a matter of three months, my bank account was overflowing and I had the ability to move and to get an apartment. Everything was working fine. So it, it's like he always, uh, Hashem always provides what we need when we're going on the path and he always provides confirmation to us. So then we go back to uh, Colorado and we say, okay, my husband's got the job, we've got the, we've got the house. Now we have to convince the two children because they're not mm -hmm. too keen on leaving all their friends. Um, at this point, our oldest is in high school, um, attending Columbine High School, and our youngest is in grade school, and she has lots of really great friends, and they're not wanting to move. And they told us that. So we're kind of in a dilemma because we want our children to be happy, but we also know that this is where we think we need to be. So we prayed, and my youngest daughter, she had a dream. Mm -hmm. uh, she said, I had a cage. I saw a cage, and there was two hamsters in it. And the, and the, the tag, the price tag on the hamster said 05, like 5 cents, 0 0.05. It was a word play. That dream was a word play. I said, so you saw two new hamsters in 05. So that was the little, you know, another one of those little breadcrumbs. Yeah. Two new hamster in 05. Wow. And so she was all excited about, wow, you know, that is so cool. So um, eventually they both came around and yeah. they said, if we, want, if we decide to stay and you don't want to stay there anymore, can we stay in New Hampshire? I mean, it was like a total 180. They were not, it was like, we're ready to go. I mean, so really Hashem moved on their little hearts to, uh, to up and go with us. And so in December, we, we, packed, we packed the house, we put it up for sale, um, and we moved to New Hampshire yep. in 2005. And my husband started his job. I got a job as a school bus driver. Um, I wasn't too keen on being a school bus driver, but I, we needed jobs. And um, so I was praying. I said, Hashem, I would really like to have 
an office job. I'd really like to learn how to manage large sums of money. I would like a job like that. Within two weeks of saying that prayer, I got hired on at Streams Ministries, the ministry we were so involved with, as a bookkeeper in their, um, in their teaching arm of the, uh, of the ministry. And within four months, I was the accounting manager. So it was like everything just kind of, you know, everything was just progressing very smoothly through that time. And mm -hmm. it was a beautiful life. We had our children, we had a beautiful home. We had nice jobs, wonderful community of people. We had a new church. Um, we were with the friends. Bridge. Yeah, the Bridge Church, which was up in um, in uh, New London, and so it was. That that was a good time, except for my husband didn't really enjoy the work. The winters were brutal. There was times when he would be out plowing snow for three days and very little sleep. Because when he yeah. when they, he got the call, he had to go until the snow stopped. And yeah, got a lot of overtime. So we, you know, that was the, that was all amazing part of it. But my husband wasn't happy, but he was going to stay in that job until mm -hmm. he retired because there was nothing else. I mean, what were we going to do? It was at that time that uh, Streams Ministries in New Hampshire decided to move back to Dallas. They had originally came from Dallas up to Streams and they were moving back to Dallas and they were talking about people can move down to Dallas or um, or not. Were they successful? They, they did, they moved to Dallas. Um, and why, why did they make the move? Were they... Mom, I think it's because the owner, the president of the ministry, um, really felt like Dallas was going to be a more a place. They wanted to have a bigger training center. It was very hard for people to travel to New Hampshire because it's kind of out of the way. So he went back to Dallas to create this this training hub. And he was a native Texan. And he was a native Texan. So I think that's you know. So him and his wife and they, they picked up the ministry. They moved <clears throat> the entire ministry down to Dallas. And I wasn't. My husband did not want to live in Dallas. So Never in my life would I think I would live in Texas because I was raised in Colorado. It got too hot there in the summer. Yeah. And we were living in the country. Moving into the middle of Dallas would be the least likely place I would move. So we, you know, we, uh, we thought about it and decided not to go. Um, instead, I presented my <coughs> employer um, with a contract and I started my own business doing bookkeeping and I acquired clients and they were one of my clients. They were my first client. I gave him a contract and said, I will do your books remotely. Um, and then if at some point, you know, that changes, you know, we'll do it on a year to year basis. And they were okay with that. So I was still employed, kind of, I was doing my own business, but they kept me on as a contractor and I continued to work for them for three years um, from a, a distance remotely and um, and that was going fine we moved out of the, the first house that we were living in we moved up onto the mountain because the the church that we were a part of um, had owned a mountain called the Pinnacle Mountain up in New Hampshire and that's where the church was going to be built and they were meeting in a tent and they were you know so we moved up onto the Pinnacle um, the house was beautiful and it was uh, it was old but it was it was it was beautiful because it had behind it just bogs and, and trails and um, paths and and we would walk those with our dogs and it, it was a great time and it was close to the church and we were able to go uh, be and be more involved with that and uh, my husband then at that point wasn't really liking his job because he got transferred to another another district. And Not liking would be <laughs> mild. I hated the job. Yeah. I didn't like the people, but I had a family. What was I going to do? So then, what did you do? What happened? So we show up in the in springtime, April first, was it not? Yeah. April tenth. Okay. No, I don't know. In the, the beginning of April. Mm -hmm. It's a Monday, and I'm and I remember thinking to myself, I'm not going to let these people ruin my day. I'm going to put in a good day's work. I'm we're following a truck driving down one of our roads, 
picking up all the limbs that got broken down from the winter before and carrying them over to the chipper and throwing them in the chipper. And this is what I think happened. <coughs> Excuse me. Hashem was up there on the throne watching me. And he's going, this guy's too dumb to quit. So I want you to go down there and take him out. <laughs> so I'm working and I go over by a limb that's lying on an old stone wall that had fallen. And I try to pick this limb up and it wasn't that big and it did not budge. So I'm spreading my feet out to get a better stance to pull on it. And all of a sudden I'm flying backwards and I, my hand spins around behind me and I land on my hand and it rips my shoulder apart. Mm -hmm. And I, knew, I heard it come apart. So right, right away I went, uh oh. And I, I'm laying there in the dirt for a minute and I grab my arm because I couldn't even move my right arm. And I put it up on top of my stomach and I go, now I've done it. And I sit up and I get up and I walk back around to the back of the truck where the rest of the crew is feeding the chipper and everything. And I'm holding onto my arm and everybody just stops and looks at me. And I said to the guy that was in charge, I said, I hurt myself. <laughs> and he said, well, do you want to go to the hospital? And I went, yeah, I have to go to the hospital. <clears throat> So, the, the, the so we're driving to the hospital, we're in the woods, it's about a 20 minute, half hour drive and about halfway there my shoulder starts hurting. So I start thumping my foot on the floorboard and I'm saying things and the guy sees the pain, he's in pain now. Takes me to the hospital, they put a, a uh, some, IV. an IV in my hand to give me some morphine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm holding on to my arm and my I'm pacing around. My pain is still there. I tell them this isn't working. They give me another shot of pain. Five minutes later I say that's not working. They give me a Percocet and then I finally went, ah, oh, okay, I can relax. They took x-rays. The guy said, well, no bones are broken. You can go back to work. <laughs> Only to come to find out that later, after he went to a specialist, that he had torn how many? There's four major muscle groups that form the shoulder. I learned all about it. Two of them were completely severed. The third one was hanging on by shreds. And the guy said, you're done. And I was in a sling for two months. And then, yeah, and then the, the surgeon that repaired my shoulder had a large enough block of time open. I had a four hour surgery and then it was another three months anyway of rehabilitation. Well, a month sitting there doing nothing and then rehabilitation. Right. And in that time he had become um, unemployable because he had restrictions <coughs> from his arm. He can't lift over a certain amount of weight. And um, it was at that time that the uh, president of Streams Ministries in Dallas called and he'd heard about his accident yep. and he said so if he can't work anymore then why are you still in New Hampshire? He said why don't you come down here we'll pay for your move. So, so they, they paid for our move and we went to um, we went to Dallas and oh, and I wanted to... Yeah. North Dallas. But it's um it was Flower Mound. It's a, it's a suburb of, of Dallas. And while we, but before we left, we attended a, a seder on uh, on Pes oh, yeah. Passover, but it was a messianic seder. They had a messianic rabbi there, and so it was like a Christian seder. And it was the first time we'd ever experienced anything like that. And we both were like so taken by it. It was mm -hmm. like because of all of the symbolism and the the meal and the, the rabbi doing all explaining and the prayers. And we were like, wow, what was that? I mean, afterwards we we talked about it for for days. We, we was the seder held. Was it was it in, in New Hampshire. In your church or um, it, in somebody's home. Oh. They and they they set a big table and there was like. How many people were there? Probably like 20, yeah. 25 Something people like that. there. Was this a messianic? It was messianic, yeah. Did they have a, a small messianic Jewish community? Or? No, this, uh, no, he was a messianic uh, rabbi from Concord, which was like 35, 40 minutes from the town that we lived in. So he drove up to do the Seder. Um, but they, the, the, um, the pastor of the church wanted to do a Seder for 
Passover. So that was our first really like, what is this? You know, we were like, and you still hadn't met any Jewish people at this time. No, not that no. we were aware. Of. <laughs> so we moved to Texas. We were in Streams Ministries, and I'm going to try to move this along because okay. I don't want to. Um, but we um, we both were employed. They they brought him on as the building manager, and I was the accounting manager, and um, everything was going great. Then the um, the uh, owner had talked about a book that he, he was he was a very learned man. He was always learning, mm. always reading, always teaching. He was very, very intelligent. And he found this book called Lost in Translation that was written by two Messianic rabbis. And basically the book was talking about all the, the um, um, contradictions that there were in the, in the um, New Testament. And they also said that the New Testament wasn't originally written in Greek; it was written in Hebrew. And because so they, they were all Jewish. So they, they were, were they were Jewish. looking at all these different <clears throat> things and pointing out the um, contradictions in the texts. We read the book and we were like, "Oh my gosh! If that's not true, what else isn't true?" And that started us both going down this road of we need to find what truth is, because we'd been in Christianity for some time now. We were in leadership. We had and problems we, you know, with it, but no answers. So we started uh, studying it out. Oh, I, I mean, oh. And um, we went online, we were listening to this messianic pastor and he was teaching the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith. Um, we were starting to listen to people online, various teachers, and a woman at my workplace attended a church in Dallas in South Lake that actually was a messianic church. And I was telling her about our, our search for truth and she said oh you need uh she says you need to find out more from the jewish bible so i went out and bought jewish bibles didn't know what i was doing but i was just buying and one day i came to work and she had gifted me with a stones edition chumash we still have it and we started to read it and it was like we could not believe what we were reading the commentary i mean it was like exploding truth exploding in front of us and we're going wow and we were, we were just enamored with it. And we were going and telling people at work, uh, at the ministry, what we were learning. And that wasn't going over so well because mm -hmm. it was challenging them and they were questioning their faith because of what we were telling them. They told the owner and the owner decided one day to have a meeting and he called my husband and I into the boardroom. And, and uh, with I euphemistically call it the Inquisition. And started to ask us questions and basically were telling us that we were bordering on heresy and um, was letting us know that we would not be there after, you know, they were giving us six months. Um, they were going to, they were basically gonna firing us, um, but giving us six months to find jobs because I'd been there for eight years. I'd been their accounting manager for a long time and we developed a lot of relationship with the people and um, and they kept me on because I was the, the only accounting manager and we were coming up on the year end where I had to close out the books. So they needed me. That was Rosh Hashanah 2012. Um, and I know that because I, we went home, we were very disturbed and distraught, of course. And I decided to write up a letter of resignation and I gave him six weeks. So I went back two days after Rosh Hashanah and I have the date on the letter of resignation and handed it to the owner and said, we'll be leaving in six weeks. You need to find my replacement. Can I just ask Ruth and Bryce, what were the main things that you read in the stone edition of the Chumash that had such a profound I impact that they thought that you were bordering on heresy? What I remember talking about is the sin offerings that they were doing was for accidental sin. And I, I don't remember specifically, but the conver conversations came up that there was no blood sacrifice for an intentional sin. And that didn't jive with- With their message what, of the- what, we, what they, what, as Christians, they believe. And my just continual sharing with them, one of them came out and told me one day, you're making me question my faith. And well, that was that was my hint, either shut up or get in trouble. And I kept sharing what we were learning. 
And the other thing is the the G, the, the lineage of the of this JC. Well, that's one of them. They have things. two different lineages, you know. and neither one of them are connected to Davido mm -hmm. Melk. And, that, and so there was like there was all this stuff they were trying to put together to make it make sense, and it, it nothing. And nothing was true. You couldn't put it together. He wasn't. If if he was who they said he was, first of all, he doesn't even have a father, so he doesn't have a lineage because he supposedly was divinely inspired. And and you know, so it's like you, you and you don't go through the mother. And so it's like clearly the writers of the of the New Testament didn't have enough knowledge about um, the halakha and the traditions of in the Jewish text. To be able to tie everything together, so there was all these missing pieces. But Ruth, can I just ask you, how did you know that the lineage has to go through the mother? Because a we, lot of uh, people that, who aren't in the Jewish faith don't really know that. We were learning it because we were we were, we were, we were going through the Chumash, and we were also learning online from other you know rabbinical places, you know teachers, and and we were just picking things up. And I was like, oh wait a minute, that can't be because he can't have a lineage through the mother, and he's supposed to be the the son of a deity and so therefore he doesn't have an earthly father so how is he connected to David Amelik? So I was just like, you know, it was like nothing was making sense. But we had issues with that beforehand and that was yeah. the straw that broke the camel's so, back when we got that book and started reading it. Yeah. Did you have any issues about like Shabbat being on a Sunday? Or yes, like that and that well. was a, another thing because mm -hmm. we had learned that it's supposed to be on, on a Saturday. A lot of the teachings that we did, the classes that, that we did in our training center were on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and we wanted Saturdays off and they wouldn't give us to do us. You know, we were we were starting to um, take on some of these things ourselves. Tisha B'Av, we went ahead and fasted. I mean, we were we were doing the things that, that we were reading about. You know, Chabad.org has an extensive website mm -hmm. where they have all this information. And so we were learning about Judaism on our own. And everything that they were doing was interfering with our path towards truth. And at this time, had you met any Jewish person? No. Or you hadn't no. gone to find a rabbi or a no. Jewish community no. in Dennis? No, it, it, it's coming. That, that, that part of it's coming because after, the, um, after we decided to leave that position, we got severance pay and we left in November of 2012. Okay, I just want to ask one thing related to this. Um, did you ever question the, the pastor or the priest and uh, say to him, look, you're the leader of the community, how do you grapple with these questions? Did you feel comfortable going to the no. leadership to ask? No, we, we knew that we couldn't ask those questions because my husband had blatantly said um, and pointedly said that he was going to live a Torah observant life. And when we had the Inquisition, mm -hmm. when we were talking with the owner and the, uh, the people that worked there, I told him, we, I'm, we're going to live a Torah observant life. And he said, that's impossible. You can't do that. And I said, well, we're going to do the best we can. And that I think that was the final nail. Yeah, he he wasn't going to listen to anything. He wasn't going to answer any questions. He because he already he was he was seeing as, as us as heretics because we had already crossed over into um, not believing that um, J C was anybody. That you know, I mean, we were, we were we were on our way of out of believing that, and yeah. and we had too many questions about it that most people can't answer because a lot of the questions that we had, if we did ask. They would just say, you have to have faith. You just have to believe. There was no answers for the questions that we were asking. If I may, I'd like to throw in the part. As I said, we both had problems with Christianity, but they don't have the answers for them. I knew I had lived previous life, and that happened to me in boot camp when I was in the Navy. We were running around the uh, track one morning, and all of a sudden it hit me like a ton of bricks. I've done this before in a previous life and I knew from that point on I had lived before and that does not jive at all with Christianity. They don't believe, they in, don't the believe in that. You have one death to die and then the judgment. That's what mm -hmm. JC says and that's what they believe and I went well they got that wrong. Yeah. And Ruth, how were your daughters? Did they follow your path or was it difficult for them? Um, our path really um, at this point our oldest daughter was married um, and she had uh, a child and they were living in Colorado our youngest daughter was living with us but she wasn't really interested and they weren't really interested in church either so they were just kind of like you know it didn't really 
they, they, it didn't bother them. They were just like, oh, mom and dad's just on another one of their, you know, religious journeys, you know, because we were always searching. And um, so our youngest daughter was living with us in Texas, but she was getting ready to move out of the house because she had graduated high but school. There was a negative feeling. No negative, negative. No, she actually bought us our first uh, Hanukkah menorah yeah, as still, a gift. I mean, if she was like, it's still up, it's up there. She, yeah, but we still uh, have it. she's very supportive. They're both very supportive of our our journey, and they. They think it's great, you so know. So a pivotal point was getting the uh, stone chumash. The chumash. So can you just speak a little bit more about that? How did you actually get it, and why did they give it to you? She gave it to us, me as a gift because we were searching. We, I said we bought some Bibles. She said, "Oh no, you need to you need to have this. This this is where you begin as this Torah." And had, was she? And she was she going to Jewish a, roots herself. Um, no, but she'd been in a Messianic congregation, and the Messianic Jews do read. The and she gave, she, she went gave it and to she me. bought you the, yeah. the that's yeah. quite a, a courageous w- thing that she did. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. that had a profound it did. impact on your lives. And there was a Havdalah candle in there and there was I mean she just she just gave us this package. It was a gift and she said, Here's for your journey, you know. So and what is her, was her belief? Was she She was messianic. She was a she was a messianic Christian, you know, I mean, she believed that uh, she believed in Christianity, but Messianic Christianity is just they add Jewish titles to it, you know, they just so they put the Jewish culture Christianity in. or with a rabbi, yeah. but she was quite pro Jewish, yeah, in other words. yeah, she was very much pro Jewish. She really she had been in the movie industry, she was a film producer, and she so she'd had in you know interactions with people, I'm sure, through her life, and um, so. She was okay with uh, with the whole Judaism thing, but she wasn't willing to go into that direction. And when you got the Stone Commission, I mean, it's quite a extensive. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of commentaries and there's a lot mm-hmm. of rabbis, and it's not so simple to go through it. But did you go from the very beginning? Did you start reading? No, I think we just opened it up and we were just seeing things, and I'm like, wow. And he would say, did you did you know this? And you know, we were just like. And and then it, we were familiar with some of the Bible stories because we'd read, you know. We'd read the Old Testament in the in the in the Christian Bible, which is it's a, it's a little different. There's some nuances it's that a are lot different, of it's different, but we we were familiar with some of the names and the places and the you know. So it was to hear the the the, the commentary around all of that was what really opened yeah. up our eyes. It really made it more of a full picture for us, and and we just knew that's where we were headed. And so we sold everything, um, and we bought an RV trailer. And after we left the ministry, and we moved into the RV trailer and and, uh, lived there for eight months. The first four months, we went through the Torah together every day because I wasn't working. We had we had money and and we lived very frugally, so we studied the Torah every day. And then I had to get a job because money was starting to run out. And then I started. I, I, I started going online and I found Rabbi Tobia Singer mm. and I started looking at his stuff and listening to all of his teachings and that was the nail that did it. It was like, okay, now we've got some real, real mm. truth here and he knows the Christian Bible better than they know it and so it was really, it was really good stuff. So I sent him a, an email of our story and said that we were interested in converting to Judaism and I didn't think I was going to get anything back. But then 48 hours, I had a response, and he said, here's my cell phone number, call me. So we called him, and the first thing he said was, welcome home. And he said, here's how you do it. So he told us how to convert. He said, you need to find a rabbi, you need to find a shul, and you need to, you know, start the process with a best din. Well, we're living, you know, we were in the RV, but at at some point in the RV, it got too small and too cramped. So we ran across these Karaite Jews, and yes, they do exist, in Texas. Yeah. And they had, um, they had a ranch, and they said, hey, you can come out. There's a house that, you know, the house that they were living in while they had their other house built um, was empty. And they said, you can live there, just pay the utilities. So we sold our RV, and we moved in there. And at first it was very nice because we were kind of talking about the Torah, and, you know, and, and they were, you know, very interested in that. But they were only interested in that. They didn't want to go into the Orthodox. Um, we are these authentic Karaites? These are authentic yeah. they care They converted to Karaite <coughs> Judaism. And it cost them a it lot of money. It cost them a money. lot of money to do that because there's, there was a mm. conversion program that they went through. And so we were living on their property, and they had a potbelly pig on their pro- property um, that they named Miss Piggy. We and named her Miss Piggy. One day they were gone, 
and or I think it was a weekend they were gone and the mailman just set the mail up on the on the uh, porch of their house and but it was a pile it was a pile so Miss Piggy decided to go through it one day when they were gone this is just the cutest little story yeah and they came back and they said oh we, we uh we got our mail it was kind of all over and I said I didn't know that you know you weren't that it wasn't in a box I would have picked it up and, they, and she said it was interesting um, because the pig ate some of the mail and I went oh no and she said the only thing that she ate was the Kerrite conversion certificates that had been mailed to them <laughs> that's what the pig ate yeah wow. and so she said do you think it's a sign and I said oh I think so <laughs> you know because she knew that we were going Orthodox and they were Kerrite so we were just mm -hmm. kind of like you know see that in Israel there is a small Kerrite community but authentic Kerrite community yeah. hmm. going back uh, wow. there were living right. in, in Eastern Europe um, there were some very, very prominent, at one time there was over a million, a million Karats yeah. in, there was huh. a big Karat community in, in Egypt. But today, even in the old city, there's a Karat show, an authentic mm -hmm. Karat show, oh. dating back. And most of the Karats are assimilating into Orthodox Judaism. Yeah. But it's, oh. it's, it's dying out, the, the numbers are dwindling. Yeah. So it was very interesting, it was, and, and, and they weren't. In, she wanted to someday make mm -hmm. Aliyah, um, but they had a nice farm there, and I didn't think that was ever going to happen. So we 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 were friends for a while. We lived there for about a year, and then it started. We started to oppose some of their viewpoints because we were learning. Um, and um, at the job that I was given, I was given. Um, it, it, you know, a rabbi singer said, "Find a shul and find a rabbi." And we're going, "Where do we find that in North Texas, in a small town in North Texas?" There's no rabbis. There's you no still synagogues. Met, uh, no, we haven't met any. You hadn't met rabbi singer. No, no, no. You're just getting We just on the phone. It's the only time. Mm -hmm. So, my job gave me a job to do. They said, "We need you to find a locksmith." I said, "Okay," it's outside of the scope of my duties, but okay. So I got three quotes. A man came. Um, and he was the one we chose and he came to the office and he had a baseball cap and a kind of a strange accent and um, I, so I looked at him and then I looked at his ring and he had Hebrew writing on his ring and I knew it was Hebrew writing because I'd been studying and I went hmm I said is that Hebrew writing and he said yes it is I, and I was like are you Jewish <laughs> and he was like totally taken <laughs> aback like why are you asking? You know, this is a small town in, te in North Texas. Why are you asking me? Um, and I, so I said, my husband and I, we want to convert to Judaism. And he says, oh, who's your rabbi? And I said, um, we don't have one. And he thought for a minute. He says, you need my rabbi. He does these kinds of things. So he gave me his rabbi's name and, con and email and, and information. He said, where do you go to shul? I said, well, we don't have one. He said, you need to go to my shul. It's full of people like you. <laughs> so... We didn't know, but you know, he's a locksmith. He's a key master to us because yeah. he unlocked our future in wow. that meeting. Because he gave us the name of the of the the the, the head of the Bayes Din in Dallas was the rabbi he gave us. Yeah. Rabbi Hara Free, Yerachmiel Freed, who's written many books on Gerus. Some books, yeah. And he and he he's the head of Data Dallas Area he's a Torah Rosh Association. Of the, uh, data, uh, yeah. I mean, it's just like. Was that our, was our connection. And he was the very first Jew that you had ever met? Yes. Face to face? Yes. And so we, uh, we contacted Rabbi Fried and I sent him an email and said, this is what we want to do. And he, of course, you know, pushed back and said, you know, you don't know what you're saying. You don't saying. know what you're saying. You don't, you know, <laughs> I'm happy that you want to do that. Have you checked out some other synagogues? You know, he was really trying to do the, the pushback. And, and I went back and said, no, we don't really want to do that. We want to, we want to become Orthodox Jews and moved to Israel. That's what we told him in the email. And he said, well, it doesn't work that way. So he agreed to meet with us. And in February, uh, we went, we drove down to his home and we met with him and he asked us a bunch of questions. Why were we interested in Judaism? What were we studying? How did we come to this? And, um, and he said, well, we've got some kosher classes starting at Data. You can start coming and maybe you can see what that's all about, about keeping kosher. So those were our first classes that we were taking. It was about learning how to, so we immediately went kosher. After we learning, we started eating kosher. And uh, so then he, uh, he said, I'll arrange a meeting with the Bayes Din. 
So then I think it was a couple months after our first meeting, we went back to his home and there was the, the Bass Den we were meeting with. And they were asking us more questions. Why do you want to convert? And what's your story? So we told the story again. And um, they just kind of looked at us and they said, well, we don't usually do this, but we're going to hook you up. <laughs> and we were like, great, now what? So uh, they told us to start coming to the synagogue and maybe see what that's like. There was a learner service in the synagogue. It was an Orthodox, um, it's Or HaTorah in Dallas. Beautiful community, um, very open to the Geirim. The people there are wonderful. It's very strong and, and loving J Jewish community. And uh, the rabbis there are very knowledgeable. There's a lot of rabbis because there was yeah. a kollel there. So they were training <clears throat> up rabbis for other kollels. <laughs> Uh, Rabbi Fried was just a, a very amazing person and um, very learned in helping us down this path. So um, we weren't living in the Arub at that point. We were we were driving from, from Van, Alstein. Van Alstein, which is like an hour away, to go to Shul and go to these classes. So and an hour back. And I was working, and I had to drive an hour to work every day. So we were putting a lot of miles on our car and a lot of sleepless nights. I mean, it was just... Um, but we we ended up starting going to the shul, and I, it was the most beautiful thing. The first time we went to the shul, it's on a Shabbos, and we're in the learner service, and we come out, and the men are all standing out in the foyer, and they're in their talus. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh. This is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. These people are amazing. And I I was just so taken in by them. And I thought this this is what I want to do. This is we need to, you know, pursue this. And and it just it, it like emboldened me even more, emboldened us to just continue on this path. And at this point, they're they're saying, well, you need to, you know, maybe you should look for a Noahide community. You know, they're trying to push us away, trying to, and so they told us to go to Houston. There was a Noahide community down there, so we went down. We spent the weekend with them, but on the way back, we got a phone call from a couple that had converted in Dallas, an older couple. It was the first uh, couple that we met, and. Uh, they called and said, we talked to Rabbi uh, on your behalf, and he has agreed to let you attend full time at the shul, because you, at that point we could only go, you know, and look. And um, so for us it was like, okay, this is where Hashem brought us, this is where we're going. And so we didn't look back. We yeah. started to look for a place in the air roof, we started to look for an apartment, um, and we were on our way to look at the apartment and Rabbi, the, one of the rabbis from the Bayes Din called and we said, hey, we're on our way to look at an apartment in the air. We said, oh, no, 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 don't do that. It's too soon. It's too soon, you know. And so um, we listened and and we lost the apartment. And we were heartbroken, you know, because it was like, we want to be in the air room. We want to be closer to the people. We want to be more, learn, doing more classes because it's just too much to drive. And um, so apartment came open again with like within two or three weeks and this one we didn't tell them we were looking at it we just went down and looked at it we signed the lease and we moved in and it was like what two two couple months of after? months later i said to the rabbi one morning oh by the way we're in the aruv now and he went oh well we need to well, have well, a meeting we have to have a meeting <laughs> and so that was when they brought us in and had us fill out the paperwork and renounce our former life and we signed the official paperwork to become in in the in the conversion program they said it was going to take about two years and then after that we would have to be in the community for two years so it was it was just this amazing opportunity and we we were so hungry we couldn't get enough it was like Judaism was so rich with heritage tradition and, and truth and honor and, and integrity and it was like the people were amazing the people that we were meeting yeah. and to be around all these wonderful quality people was like this is I mean, two years we were thought, that's too long. We wanted to be now, you know, and we wanted to go to Israel, but you can't unless you're, you know, so it was like, so we went through the program. We went through all of that. We had an amazing mentor, um, a, a rabbi who was our um, sponsoring mentoring rabbi. and sponsoring rabbi who walked us through the program and took us through the Shulchan Aruch in two years. And he took us through all, you know, and we, we literally learned everything you need to learn to be a Jew you know, um, and all the Shabbos books. And we had to read lots of books and we had to go lots of classes and we spent lots of time with 
with beautiful families and on, on Shabbos meals. They would invite us and they want us to tell them their story and and people were getting to know us and it was like I mean there were so many miracles along the way. I needed a job, I got a job, you know, and then I and then I was like at that job and I um it was working around people and the music and it was just like it was totally secular it was well it was it was a non Jewish environment and I thought, Hashem I need I need a job where I can grow in my Judaism. So he gave me a job working from home. And the job came in a way that I went and told the person what I was looking for, and she said, that never happens. We don't get jobs like that, but we'll keep your, uh, your resume on file. She called me within two hours and said, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> a guy just called looking for exactly what you're asking for, and I got hired, and I was with that company for two years, working from home and growing my Judaism. I mean, it was like these kinds of things were happening all the time. Hashem was always leading and guiding. And uh, after two years, we... Um, we had to go through some turmoil. We went through some anti-Semitism in the Dallas community, um, which was a good sign because we that told. means we were on we were on the right path. If you're experiencing anti-Semitism, that means that you know you're getting close. That's what other people who had converted before us had said because there were converts that were living in the in the uh, air roof with us, and um, so we were walking home from a Shabbos meal and people drove by and yelled slurs at us you know and we're threatening and so it was like and, and then there was a problem with with my husband's bris they were like okay oh. now we need we need to check this out and it took like almost a month and a half and we thought oh no what if we can't convert because of you know the issues and it was like and then like two weeks before um before we can we're going to go to the mikvah the the rabbi met with us and said okay we think it's we think it's time and at that time i was building our chuppah my husband and I were working on building our chuppah because we knew it was. It felt like it was getting close. You know, it's close to that two-year mark, and we're going, okay, this is something's going to happen. So we started to build a chuppah because we thought we're going to be ready for it when it happens. Because we'd had heard stories about people who said, you know, they were just minding their own business, and the rabbi comes up and says, "What are you doing on Sunday?" And that's what you know. And that was like, okay, meet me at the mikvah because today's the day. So. Um, we built our chuppah, the, the rabbi came by and he was testing us and um, everything was good and then our, we had a dog at the time and there was a stray dog that got um, that we had captured to try to help find the owner and, and he was on the, the porch and our dog was inside and somehow um, they met and that wasn't a good thing and my husband got in the middle of it and he had his hands all bit up and they were bleeding and he and the dog was astray so he had to go through and you got shots. I got bit and and so it was like and you know you can't go to the mikvah if you have open wounds mm -hmm. so we're going oh no what happened you know it was like so it was like you know we had these few things that were happening but then our, our wounds were starting to heal and um, the do and the rabbi looked and he said you're there's no problem with those so you're gonna be fine so we ended up going to the mikvah on Rosh Kodesh Adar and we got married that same day under the chuppah that we that we built, and uh, we had a lot of beautiful people from the uh, community in attendance to the wedding. We and wanted to convert under Parshas Yisrael, Yisrael but, but it ended up being Parshas Teruma. Teruma. So Hashem has uh, has His plans, mm -hmm. and um, so you know I'm going to fast forward through a Can lot. I just of, ask, yeah. at, at your wedding. Yeah. Um, did your daughters attend? No, um, no, our daughters were not not living in Texas, okay. and they they couldn't make it back. But they were so happy for you. They were happy for us. Yes, we sent pictures, and, and you know, happy. we we try to teach them a little bit along the way. You know, we send them little things. You know, it's like this. And were they happy with your conversion? Yes. Yeah. They they at first they didn't understand. They're like, what do you you know? Because they didn't know a lot about it. But we were explaining what it was, and they were you know they were very supportive. Very supportive yeah. of it. And can I ask, when you went into the mikveh, because mm -hmm. this is a very, mm -hmm. uh, did you feel a lot of spirituality when you went into the mikveh, when you converted? She did. She went first. I'm hanging out at the apartment thinking, oh, I've got plenty of time and I was going to do this in the mikveh and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. She was done and I get a text from Harav <laughs> Freed, where are you? And I went, oh no! <laughs> So I charge over there in a panic and I charge into the women's mikvah and they weren't through with her yet and they turned me around and got me back out. And then after that I, I never did relax. I forgot everything that I wanted to do. But I had heard that the, um, the, the Shekinah or the presence hovers above the waters of the mikvah. 
Somebody, my, my attendant told me that. And so I wanted to take the time to experience that after the mikvah. Tell the story and about that, when she went to, that was funny. What? When she came to pick you up. Oh, she, when, when my attendant came to pick me up to take me to the, to the women's mikvah, um, she pulls up, she says, good morning, how are you? I get in the car and I just look at her and then I start to cry and she said, okay, let's go then. <laughs> and uh, so we, we headed off. She wasn't going to have any more of the blubbering or anything like that. So uh, we get there and um, I went to the mikvah. I, I spent the time, you know, just really trying to observe the kadusha of the moment and really soak it in. And I'm telling you, colors were never brighter than they were after the mikvah. My first meal I had after the mikvah was almonds, raisins, and an orange. And it tasted like I'd never had it before. It was so amazing and sweet. And it was like, wow. I mean, it, everything was clear. And I, I knew that I was different. And when I looked at my husband, I saw that he was different. He carried himself. He was Boaz. He was, you know, it was like it really was a, a spiritual experience. And I... I, I still, to this day, I can remember the taste of the, that food, you know, and and just the whole atmosphere of the of the the wedding and going under the chuppah and all the meaning behind it and all of the and the dancing and the people we had, we had so many beautiful yeah. people there that were giving us these blessings and really really we embracing were giving out us. The blessings yeah, too. we were giving out the blessings. We were, and so it was like. It was a beautiful day, and it was like, it was a day that I feel like I came home. I was home. All the striving, all of the want, all of the desire, all, because prior to being a Jew, I felt like I was standing at the gate of Hashem's house, and I wasn't allowed in. And it was very painful, because I just wanted to go in and get as close to Hashem as I could. I'd always had that in me, from a, from a very small child, to be as close to Hashem as I could be. And it was, it was hard to feel like I couldn't go any further than that gate. So when I went into that mikvah and I came out and I was, I was a part of the family, it was like I came home. I was a member of that group of people that went through that sea. And it was, it, it was very real. And, and we refer to what I do anyway as taking the plunge mm -hmm. when, we, when we did our mikvah. But for me it was, like I said, I forgot what I wanted to do. But everything was fine. The, the three men were in there and they were asking me questions and mm -hmm. everything went fine. And then the wedding. And then we had two years of learning more in the, in the community after that. And, and then the, the, we actually asked, I have to take credit for this. <laughs> About a year after we'd been officially Jewish, I said we should start all the paperwork now because we've heard different stories. I said, let's start doing that now. But it wasn't, we, we started thinking about that, but it wasn't until July of 2018 when I heard a, a teaching or shear from Rabbi Alan Anava, he's in Sfat, and he was telling people it's time to come home. The, the Jews in the diaspora need to mm. come back to Israel, it's time to come home. And it was like after that, I was sold. I mean, he was talking about it, but I wasn't quite sold on mi moving to Israel. When I heard that shear, it was like something just kind of pricked my heart and I went, okay, we need, we need to do this. So we started the Nefesh Benefesh um, uh, paperwork in July and um, that was July 2018. We took our pilot trip in January 2019 and we had our interview with the Jewish agency here in Jerusalem. Somebody told trip. us, bring your paperwork and yeah. do it in Israel. Yeah, so we had, our, uh, we had our meeting with them and he told us it would be about what is four to six weeks that we were anyway. doing something, and so we came. We continued on through our travels, not knowing where we were going to go, but we knew we were coming to Israel. We knew we were going to okay. live here. So I wanted to just ask. First of all, it is the most amazing thing that we have Rus and Boaz, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's from the story of. Uh, yeah. You know, it's the. You couldn't have chosen two most amazing names, and um, what 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 actually. Why did you choose these names? Because they're very significant. My wife did all the research and she picked them, but as I believe and as I said earlier, Hashem is the one that picks the names. 
And we think it was us that did it, but... It happened around Shavuos, um, before we even were in the air roof. We were just starting out on our learning and, and, and searching. And we knew, and I had, I had read something that said you're going to have to choose names when you convert to Judaism. So I went, oh, so we should start thinking about that now, you know. And um, it was around Shavuos, and we wanted to celebrate that. And so we did it our own way, what we knew from what we'd learned. And we had a meal, and we read the Book of Rus on <laughs> Shavuos. As I was reading it out loud, we came to the part about Rus and Naomi's interaction. And she's trying to tell her to go home. And Rusa said, no, where you go, I will go. When I started to read that, I started to cry because I so related to Rus at that point. And I knew no matter what name I picked, Rus was going to be in it because I connected with her very deeply by reading that story. And she your, your people will be my people. And my husband, you know, he's very tall, and we heard about the pillar, one of the pillars of the temple was Boaz, and you know, and then we, the whole story of Shavuos, Rus and Boaz, and I thought, that would be amazing, but, um, so, but I wasn't choosing Rus as the first name, I'd had something else in mind, but I knew Boaz would be his first name. So I, the name that I had originally chosen for myself before we converted, somebody came to me and said, I don't really see you as that. Have you ever thought about the name Devorah? And I'm like, I don't want the name Devorah. I just didn't, you know. And she said, well, just check it out. Just research it. So I researched. Who was Devorah, this prophetess, this woman that was a judge of Israel? And I started to read about her, and I thought, wow, I have a lot of the same characteristics, and she's really quite an amazing woman. So then my husband, he's Boaz, and I found out that Devorah's husband was Barak, who was the general, and I went, wow. So it was like, all of a sudden, it was double Basharitz, you know? We had Rus and Boaz, and we had uh, Devorah and Barak, and so I said, that's our names. So it was, um, we we chose those names, and the rabbi agreed. He thought they were good names, and they fit very the qualities. Special. Very, yeah. very meaningful and very special. And, and our um, last our name, last name picked, we it didn't work out, and we told Harab Friedman. He paused for a minute, and he went, that's too complicated. Pick something simple like Abrams. So we, we did. Okay. We changed our names legally before we left the States. What was your name before? Lotz. And, and you changed the We changed it to Abrams. So we are officially Boaz and Rose. We, we, on our, we changed all our paperwork. Our documentation has been changed. Um, and that's that's who we are. Mm -hmm. so. And I just want to ask, you know, you said something quite amazing. You said when you spoke to the rabbi, you said you want to become Jewish and you want to live in Israel. Mm -hmm. you, you had never been to Israel before. No. So what, and I found this something quite unique and quite amazing. People that get involved, converts in Judaism, they immediately develop a Kesha connection with, with the land of Israel. Right. You knew that you wanted to come live in Israel, even before you had visited Israel. Right. How do you explain this? Um, I, don't, I don't know that I can. It was just like, when you're reading the text, and it says that Israel is the land of, of the Jews, and it's the land that Hashem gave to us as an inheritance, it's like, I took that very, very serious. And for me, it was like, if that's where we're supposed to live, and that's our goal. That's the end game. We need to be there. But we couldn't be there unless we were Jews. So we had to go through the, per you know, it was like, you know, it was like, we just knew that that's where we needed to be. So there was a process that we had to go through to get there. And because that's what the, that's what the Bible says. We're supposed to live here in Israel. And why not? It was given to us. It's our land. And there's so many people that I just, my heart, you know, this is a big thing for us right now is we want to help people come to Israel. So we've got a couple that we know in Dallas who came on a pilot trip last November. They're making Aliyah August 26th is their, their Aliyah flight. And they're going to stay with us and we're going to help them get on their feet mm -hmm. here so they can find their own place. We want other people to come. And they're also converts. Well, Ruth and, and uh, Bryce can ask. Um, Sure, there's so many questions to ask, but um, when you first arrived in Israel on your pilot trip, mm -hmm. what was your impression when you first landed in Israel, when you knew this is the land you want to make your future, this is the land you want to live in, 
And what was your first impressions when you saw Jerusalem? Oh my gosh. Can I share? Yeah, go ahead, please. Well, when we did our pilot trip, it was out on the apron and they brought a, a, a stairway up and we walked out onto the ground. And I, I've heard a lot of people kiss the ground when they do that. And I thought, I will do that when we move here. When we, when we were on our trip to move here, they brought that uh, walkway up to the plane. I never had a chance to do that. So we walked up that tramway and I turned the corner and then I see guys holding two signs up. That's, One yeah, says that's Olin. Hmm? That's not what he asked though. He's asking what your, what your impression of Israel was the first time you came. The first time? Yeah. I couldn't stop looking at everything. Yeah. I was looking everywhere. Except did you for feel the connection? Did you feel this is... I automatically did, when I, especially when, I, when we drove yeah. into Jerusalem. And I'm looking and on the street corner, there's Jews everywhere. <laughs> there's guys wearing black and white. The women have got their hair covered. They're all, I mean, because you're coming from a, a you know, a non-Jewish yeah. nation. You're, and even if you're in a Jewish community in America, you're still not able to see what you see here. Everybody around us was Jewish. And it was yeah. like, we're home. <clears throat> this is where we don't stand out. We are home. We're like everybody else, and these are our people. And well, except for that hat. <laughs> yeah. I wear that hat, and it's been the most bizarre thing. Cowboy I've been wearing hat. it in Gaula and Maya Sharim, <laughs> and I hear, Boaz! <laughs> and I look, and some young man comes running across the street. You remember me? I met you in Dallas, and I went, um, <laughs> But Remind it's like, your name? I felt like I was at home and I was looking around the scenery and I was breathing yeah. in the air and it was so easy yeah. to dive and it was so clear. Everything was like, it's like my mind was not fuzzy. It was just, this was, a, this was where we needed to be. And I, when I, you know, I, I didn't want to leave on our pilot trip. And then when I went back, I was working in the synagogue as the bookkeeper there and the rabbi that I reported to, he was asking me, so are you guys going to make Aliyah? Because they didn't want us to go because they wanted me to stay and wanted us to stay in our positions because he was doing the landscaping. And and I said, you know, I can still feel the stones of the old city under my feet. And the rabbi said, you're going home. So it was like, you know, it was uh, even after I left, I could still feel the stones under my feet. And I said, surely, Hashem, you want us to come home. You want us to all come home. We're your children. We're asking you to come home. And he opened up the door. And on the exact anniversary of our mikvah, we got a letter from the Jewish agency saying we've been accepted for sure. for yeah. Aliyah. So we went, well, that was no coincidence. We need to get ready. It's all the shit. It's all the shit. <laughs> oh, and so it was, it was so amazing. And then, you know, it's like, and then I'm thinking, how am I going to pack up my house? We got all this, we got a three bedroom townhouse and all this stuff and we had a business and we had all this equipment and I'm going, what are we going to do? Somebody tells me, here's the name of a man. He just moved here from Baltimore. Oh, well, we were, we were going to do a yard sale. Yeah, and he, she said, here's the name of a man. He just, he's a friend of mine. He just moved here from Baltimore and bought a house and he's looking for some furniture. So, you know, maybe you should give him a call. And I said, okay. So I didn't think, he, you know, I'm, and I called him and I said, yeah, this is what we have to sell. And I took some pictures and he said, well, how much are you asking for different items? And he said, just put a spreadsheet together of what you're selling and how much you want for it, and then I'll come down and look at it. So he came down, he looked at the spreadsheet, he looked at all the stuff, he said, how much you want for the whole thing? <laughs> he bought it all. Wow. <laughs> except for the stuff that we were bringing and the stuff that he didn't need. Well, you know, the books and our clothes. Yeah, and, and wow. some dishes we, we brought with us, some books. Wow. And, and it was like Hashem took care of that yeah. part. I didn't have to do a big, huge garage sale, but we did end up doing a, a yard sale at the end because there were still some things like, you know, uh, electronics and stuff mm -hmm. that we tried to sell and clothing and stuff. And and then we just gave the rest of it away to the Jewish uh, Resource Center, and and we sold our business, and so you know, and 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 we had money. I don't know how it how happened, but it was like all of a sudden, all the money we needed to make Aaliyah was there. Hashem yes. provided everything. The day before we left on our on our trip on, uh, to come for our Aaliyah flight, a rabbi in the neighborhood uh, in the air roof called and said, um, "I hear you're needing a job," because I didn't have a job to come to. And I was concerned, I'm not going to have Parnassa. And a lot of people say, How, I can't go, I don't have Parnassa. Yeah. The day before we flew out, he calls and says, I hear you need a job. I need a bookkeeper. Call me when you get there and we'll talk. 
I'm still working for him today. Yeah, that's amazing. Wow. So Hashem, has, he's provided everything that we have needed. And he's provided the community here. It's a beautiful community. Rabbi Greenblatt. Yeah. And um, we have you we know, precious we gonna... friends. My husband's been able to attend Or Samach Yeshiva. They took him in. They, you know, he's been learning. It's been an amazing experience. Yeah. And we're in, all the things that we, you know, that you hear, well, it's too expensive or it's too, you know, the places are too small. Yeah, they're, they're cozy, but they're adequate. And it's what we need because Hashem gives us what we need. So. And when we got off the plane and I'm walking up the tramway, we turn the corner and I see this guy holding two of those signs up, huh. Olim and Abrams. Abrams. And I'm thinking, what a coincidence. I know some people that sound just like that. And I go say, well, we're Abrams. And went, okay, let's go. And the guy that's leading us through, I don't remember his name, but he is a big wig with immigration. As we're walking through and skipping through areas, everybody's looking at this guy and going, oh, hello. And he knows everybody. And, and they're so, going, oh, who are they? So yeah. they, they brought us right up into immigration, got us uh, processed through. We were the only Olim on the plane. Yeah. And um, and it was like, it was beautiful. They said, welcome to Israel. We, they had us filling out the paperwork and they were so kind. And what yeah. do you want your name to look like? You know, I mean, it's like they, they thought about everything because they do this on a regular basis, of course. But <laughs> um, it was like, we were home. Yeah. We didn't. It, they, we don't even think about going back to the states. There's no reason to. Yeah. There's We're just here. really no reason, other than our children, and that's the thing that that's the part that I have a problem with. But it's really not a problem because Hashem's going to take care of that too, like He does everything else. And he's going to come visit. And he was going to yeah, well. and that, they're talking about coming here to visit. So it's like I don't have to go back now. My parents they won't come, and that's that's a part of me that's sad. Well, um, Dad, though, he won't leave the house, so my, I mean, they, no They've got a beautiful <laughs> land out in farm country. They've got a property with, with lots of land, and my dad, he's, he's an outdoorsy kind of guy. He doesn't go out and do... My, my mom, she's re, they're both retired. They're happy where they are. I contact them once a week. We have great phone calls. I try to keep in, in, in the loop because they're a little worried, you know, because they hear mm -hmm. things. Um, but our children are talking about coming to visit, which is I'm very happy about. That would be the only thing that I would have to go back for if, if Shem allowed me to. But I really don't think he's going to allow me to because I think that, you know, they're, they're going to come here and then things will... And, with, and your sister, are you in touch with her? Um, yeah, she lives right next door to my parents. They, ha both, they both have houses on the same property. And, and with your, your parents and your sister, were they happy with the part that you chose becoming Jewish? Um, my was mom... Very difficult? My mom was not happy with it at first. She's, she, she thought I was turning my back on the things that she taught me, her, her Christianity, her faith. My dad didn't care because he doesn't have a faith. He's, he's very agnostic and atheistic. He's just... He uh, says he, he is. Says I he think is, he's but I, you know. something. But um, my sister, is, is, she doesn't believe there's a God. And, and so she's like, well, whatever you're going to do, you know, it's, it's your life. And that's really basically how... Um, my family approached it. I mean, they've never uh, they've never discouraged me from going out and mm -hmm. trying to be who I need to be and find my own way. My never even when I was seven, getting on the church bus, they never stopped me from going, you know, and looking for God. So they weren't really happy about it uh, going of us converting. But once we did, and we still kept in contact, they saw that we were normal. We'd visit them from time to time, and they were like, "Okay, so this is good." It was really hard for them when we made a Aliyah. Yeah, yeah. My my parents. Which is, it's hard for anyone who's making yeah. Aliyah and, and leaving parents. We went and saw them before we before we left the states, and we spent some time with them. And my mom was very nervous about yes. it, um, and she didn't want to say goodbye. She was thinking bad things were going to happen, and she. But now you know we've been here a little over a year. I call her every Sunday. We have wonderful communication. Um, I tell her how beautiful and wonderful our life is here, and she's happy. She just wants me to be happy. That's what she tells me. So they're not, they don't, they don't hinder me, but uh, they had to work through some issues. We all did together, I think. And was your family and your, your immediate family and friends and extended family, were they happy with your decision? Well, as I mentioned, my, my family is all... They all gone. They're all gone, but they all, Hashem let me see, they're very happy. Um, we have a couple of friends from our previous life that we talked to, 
But most of them... They didn't don't, don't, so I don't yeah, talk to when, us. <laughs> when, you, when, you, when, you, when you tell somebody that you go after being in something for a number of years and then going, you know what, this is wrong, and stepping out of it, it shakes them up yeah. and... And we lost. We lost. lost yeah, yeah. We lost a lot of people. Yeah. Really. We lost. I mean, it's just. Uh, we talked to two families. Now. Two families out of our entire past that we talked to. Everybody else is just gone. They don't. You know. Yeah. So it, you know, you, you, thankfully, we didn't have to go through the hurt that some people have gone through because some people have lost family over it. Yeah. We thankfully we didn't lose family over it, but we did lose all our friends. We lost all our connections to what we were and who we were, and and so it just made sense to change our names, new identity, new people. We're we're now Jews, and we live in Israel, and we are Boaz and Rus, and we you know. Did you have any friends that they saw how happy you were and how fulfilled they wanted to join your path? No. 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 We've talked to a couple of close friends on the phone and I've tried to point out things to them mm -hmm. that didn't go anywhere we actually stopped in when we were in Colorado no. before we left we stopped in and saw some fa a family the the family that we met at their home group um, my husband was friends with them very good friends and he was the best man at our wedding uh, we actually popped in on a surprise visit and told them what we were doing and they they don't ha have any interest in knowing the truth or what we're doing or wow. they, they're still good friends you know but it's like you have your beliefs we have ours and that's yeah. where they leave it so yeah so I'm gonna ask you both <clears throat> you've gone through the most incredible journey and life-changing what advice would you give people who are interested in, in finding Judaism what what um, you've done it you've gone through it mm -hmm. is there any any advice that you could give or don't give up follow your heart if you know if you're feeling a connection and you're feeling a drive and a pull towards this even though you're gonna be pushed away don't give up keep going ask Hashem to keep leading you and guiding you because yeah. he will and go into the training too and the, and the courses because that'll show you what it is and then you can go and make a decision based on on actual knowledge and, right. and facts well this is what i'm going to be this is how i'm going to live if i do this because they tell you they tell you the yeah. things like you know you won't be able to do this when you convert <laughs> you won't be able to you know you it, it's you don't go back can't Once have you convert, any more you never cheese go back. You know, it's like all of these things that they say you can't do it's like well you have to come to terms with that and mm -hmm. if you really are truly a spark and that's what I think that's what that's converts are I mean the Baal Shem Tov said we're supposed to go out and gather those sparks back you know into the fold we don't know why we are what we are why we had to go through the journey that we went through but we totally believe that we were sparks from those people who were in at Mount Sinai we stood there we heard we accepted the Torah somehow throughout the years throughout the millennia we had to come back through this door and if somebody has this amazing pull, they can't explain, they don't know why, but they just need it, don't give up. Don't, don't let somebody take, away, take that away from you. But if you don't have this extreme pull and it's just an interest, then make sure that you're sure before you do it. And I think yeah. a lot of people, you know, a lot of those rabbis know how to, to get people mm -hmm. to that point. But I, I would just say don't give up and, and, and embrace the changes don't be afraid of the changes embrace them because it's we're, we're better people on the other side you know we, we and better prepared much better prepared we have amazing um, we have an amazing purpose and every Jew has an amazing purpose and mm -hmm. we get to embrace that every day and live it out and you don't want somebody to try to take that from you so just you just keep going yeah, sure. I just want to thank you. Um, so, this, this quickly just, so to uh, Boaz and Root, um, it's an amazing thing, but you know, from Boaz and Root came um, Merit David and, um, and the temple from their son, and the Mashiach is going to come. Yes. So we had uh, Solomon coming and uh, David and Tehillim and it came through through Ruth and through Boaz. And you've been Zohar to have your names and to be part of Am Yisrael 
and your story and is absolutely inspirational. You are such amazing people and you, your journey is thank incredible. You. And from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you so much. It's really been, it's been such an honor, such a mm. sweet to, to, to listen and you've opened up your hearts and you've told us your, your life journey. And I really want to thank you. You're so and you welcome. You have all the muzzle and brocha and all, just all of Hashem's blessings, which you so both richly deserve. Mm. Amen. Amen. And thank you thank so you much. And, and well. it's greatly appreciated. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for the opportunity.